Welcome to The Extra Dimension. This episode is part of a mini-series about transportation, largely inspired by a series of articles on Vox.com. Today, Andrew Bailey, Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, Ian Buck, Ian Decker, and Ryan Rampersad will talk about individual car ownership. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED15. This is an episode with an abnormally large number of people. We're going to go around and each say our names. I am Ian Buck. I am Brian Mitchell. I'm Ian Decker. I am Ryan Rampersad. I'm Brian Johnson. And I am Andrew Bailey. <laughs> oh, please excuse the ones who are remote. They uh, don't know how to do speaking turns. Why? Well, you guys just... They can't body language. That's okay. Right. That's that is totally fine. This is the guy sharing a microphone. Yeah, I'm right. having to pull it back and forth. <laughs> Shh. We make do. We make do. What are we here for? So yeah, we're about to talk about cars, and uh, honestly, I think all of us here are are more on the side of we want to get away from cars, which is going to probably color a lot of what we're talking about here. But interestingly, I'm... we've all like owned cars, and we've all driven cars primarily as a method of getting around. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's be clear. Now. Do any of you actually own a car? Like, you know, you're not paying it off. You actually own it. Good job, uh, Dicker. Me too. I I have, but I do not currently. So it seemed like Decker was about to kind of dissent a little bit. I'd like to hear that. I mean, I I like having my car in the sense of what it affords me, especially as a gigging musician, being able to carry stuff this way and that way and being as busy as I am running from place to place, it's important to have that transportation stuff. So I, I like having it and I like having that option there and the convenience of that there. Yeah. And so that speaks to a lot of the pros that we're about to talk about for cars is that it's, it's honestly the most versatile form of transportation that we have period, you know, because you can carry other things with you. It's always there when you need it, right? You don't have to wait. Uh, you don't have to be on, a, on anybody else's schedule. Yeah. It is door to door. So you go directly from where you're going to, to where you're going to. And it can go longer distances than most in a shorter amount of time. Plus, if it's a nice day out, it's nice to just go for a drive. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I would insert bike ride there. But, <laughs> but that's me. <laughs> Well, you know my history with bikes, but that's a story for a different right. day. I, I biked to get to this podcast recording. I don't know what that says about this episode or not. <laughs> Biased. <laughs> well, for whatever for whatever it's worth, I um I took the trek from uh the, the a suburb of Minneapolis to Minneapolis for the better part of for the better part of six years now. So uh on a on a daily basis. And that, that was that was a a relatively average commute by by MnDOT standards. Apparently, most Minnesotans spend between half an hour and forty five minutes in a car per day on average. Most commuting Minnesotans, that is. That that seems rather low. Yeah, it seems perfect. Is that both directions? Yeah. Or Sorry, single direction. Uh, per direction. Yeah, Sorry yeah. That. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 spot on. <laughs> that's that's about where I sit for my my current job. Me too. Yeah, right, right, right. And that's definitely while while we may have more people who. Uh, or, or a, a smattering of people who who commute by bike, for example, to get to the show, or or occasionally, or even primarily, like I think we've all definitely uh, are relatively qualified when it comes to discussing this one way or another. Right. <laughs> Although, yeah, we we all come from uh, kind of a similar perspective. We're we're all relatively young, and and we're going to see an article that has to do with uh, do millennials drive <laughs> less than previous generations. I don't know about millennials, but I hear snake people do. <laughs> snake people also do less walking. Huh. This is because tr- <laughs> they don't have legs. Because yeah, okay, okay. So let's talk wow. about some of the cons of uh, driving a car, of uh, individually owning a car. So on the flip side of it not taking physical effort is that it doesn't take physical effort, right? It's not a very good exercise. 
you do have to be focused on driving for the entire commute, so you can't be productive with other things, uh, as you may if you if you have somebody else driving you, or if you are in a public transportation vehicle. So that mm. will change in the future as self-driving cars become right. better, but that's probably you know a decade away or something. And yeah, and, and we'll be talking about that in a future episode of the Extra Dimension. And that's if people choose to use the self-driving feature, yeah. right? Well, I mean, once we get, like really get into self-driven car. Time in, in the timeline, they won't even have wheels like a steering wheel or anything, they won't have controls. Mm. No, yeah, uh, but I like driving. Well, you are you'll you'll yeah, go to the driving one. course and be like, right? I was, I was gonna say, I I, I, I was gonna shout out to you. I, th- I think it was uh, Decker, you you pointed out that like going for a drive can just be like a fun thing. Yeah, for, for those of us uh, who who enjoy that sort of thing, so that that is one con that I see that's not currently listed on our list of cons. This is going um, to seem like a weird comparison at the time, to- at right now in present time, but I think it might be something that is legitimately discussed in like in the future when self driven yeah. cars are more prevalent. Uh, is that well, it's fun to go out and shoot a gun, but I'm not allowed to just do that in the middle of the city. What it, oh, do you man. Think, will we ever get to a point where cars are the same way? It's kind of fun to drive, but like I I'm think, not allowed to do that so. in the middle of the city. I I mean, I don't think so. I think the utility of cars and the utility of guns is quite different. Yeah, that's true. Yes, and so um, I <laughs> given, use the same given the argument. Fact, given the fact that guns are supposed to kill people, whereas cars are meant to drive people around, right? Regardless of where yeah. they are, guns anywhere probably do the same thing. <laughs> Uh, so some more cons of owning a car. Um, you have to pay for a lot of things, right? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So gasoline, insurance, maintenance, uh, especially, you know, the maintenance and kind of the upfront cost of owning a car are kind of inversely proportional, right? If you get like a cheap car, you're probably going to be spending a lot more on maintenance um, yeah. and, and vice mm-hmm. versa. You have to deal with traffic in ways that most other forms of transportation don't make you do. If you're on public transportation during a congested time, you just have to deal with sitting next to a lot of people. Yep. But you don't have to deal with, like, the frustration of trying to drive through a lot of other obstacles. Yeah, that is, I I am not going to lie, I actually get a bunch of anxiety whenever I'm driving through people, and that actually gives me some road rage. Mm Mm-hmm. Owning individual cars also encourages people to live farther from work and school, which is, as we're going to talk about more, there's there's a lot of talk about strong neighborhoods being more walkable and, you know, then, then people in theory get out more and meet other people and it's, it's you know, more of a healthy community. But when everything is, is built with the assumption that you're going to be driving, that's not nearly as common. It's also much more pollutive per person than any other form of transportation because you've just got like one or two people in a single vehicle as opposed to 10 to 20, you know? Though so, the flying is probably an exception. I think that that's true. Uh, yeah. Worse. Yeah. When we're just talking about stuff within one metro area, though. Yeah. 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 And I mean, if you can afford a private helicopter, you're <laughs> you don't need to listen to this. Right. <laughs> also, cars spend most of their existence parked and not being used. It's also inefficient for society as a whole because since we all ha- like have to own individual cars, it's costing everybody as a whole a lot more money than if we were sharing resources. And um, you know, even if we were primarily using cars, but there were, we were doing a lot more carpooling and car sharing and stuff like that, that you know, that would still be more efficient. And then it kind of goes in with the thing of you know, there's that famous picture of a bus with a bunch of people in it compared to a whole like block of street in New York city where the cars fill up the entire space, but mm-hmm. they could all ride one bus. So the roads would be less filled with cars and other vehicles, mm-hmm. less cars need to be parked, be <coughs> less mm-hmm. like air pollution and things as well as, you know, the roads would need to be as maintained as much if they were smaller or sure. Not yeah. as existent, not as heavily used. I should say. Um, also driving is, is a great form of transportation for those who can drive. But yes. yeah, but there are segments of the population who can't do that. For example, if you're very young, you can't get a license until you're like 16 in most places. And if you get old and uh, are deemed no longer worthy of driving, then uh, you're kind of, you know, in either of those cases, you're really out of luck because we haven't built most of our cities to account for cases where you're not driving. And then also you don't get to interact with other people while you're driving. 
Um, which is kind of, you know, it depends on who you are. If you are an introvert, that might be a good thing. If you're an extrovert, that's not so good. And then, finally, more of a neutral point about cars is that we are paying large amounts for car-based infrastructure uh, via taxes. So most of our roads are free, and toll roads are, are much less common than one would expect from a straight economic point of view. For which I am glad. <laughs> uh, then then I guess none of you have been to Pennsylvania. There are toll roads like everywhere. Okay. Yeah. I am it's, yeah. <laughs> and and it's, and they're even worse in New Jersey. I've only really experienced toll roads in Chicago. Yep. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so that's a way of offsetting it. And we have something similar to that here in Minnesota with Min Pass, which is it's kind of a toll road, but it's not. It's it is a lane that you can buy into. There's like a little sensor that you put in your car that charges you as you go past that allows you to actually bypass a lot of the busy traffic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's it's usually set up as like either you have that little chip that you paid for or you're carpooling or using a motorcycle or some other thing that they want to encourage. Yeah. Yeah. So now we're going to get quite a bit deeper into each of these subjects. So we'll start off each of these articles with a summary of the article, and then uh, we will discuss it uh, more in depth. So first up, we have kind of an, an overall view of car for cars as uh, related to commuting. So driving to work alone is definitely the most dominant form of commuting here in America. By percentage, it rose slightly since 2000, mostly taking that that market share away from carpooling. And reasons for this include there are more cars per household than before, and the number of cars that a person owns is the best indicator of their likelihood of driving to work alone. There are less people per household, so we have at the same time more cars and less people in each household, which affects carpooling a lot because most carpools are within a household. Mm. So if you have multiple people who are going from one house to work, they're more likely to carpool. But when you've got less people, that's not as likely. Lower gas prices and more fuel efficient cars have made it less of a necessity to carpool. Yay. Yeah. Women entering the workforce has had an interesting effect because we have more income per household so they can afford more cars. And also spouses often have different work destinations, so they are not able to carpool together as well. Um, Suburbs. Woo, this is a big one. Suburbs. So when you live in an area where you basically have to drive no matter what you want to get to, carpooling is infeasible. And then even with recent trends away from driving alone, for example, you know, more people are taking biking or transit to work. Those trends aren't going back towards carpooling. So carpooling isn't isn't making a, a comeback at the expense of individual car commutes. Also, income isn't really a predictor anymore of whether a household owns a car or not. So we're just talking about the difference between zero cars and having at least one car. Because there is a decreasing cost of car ownership. Um, Decker is actually an example of this, right? Because you just got your car from your parents. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was it was lent to me so that I could get myself to and from a job while I was at college because mm-hmm. there was a job that I was working at that was about an hour away. And then they also let me borrow it for the summer and then the year after that and then the summer after that, the year after that. And then they basically were like, okay, you know what? It's, it's your car at this yeah. point. And then cars last a lot longer than they used to. So it's really easy to get a used car these days. I, the statistic that they mentioned in the article kind of blew my mind is that the average age of a car these days is over 10 years old. Hmm. which means like can you imagine because we're we are constantly making new cars that means that we have tons and tons of cars that are over 20 years old that are like older than me what is going on i I mean my mine is only a few years younger than us right yeah and i i thought i was getting on the old side when i was driving a car that was a 96 when i was in college right so my my first car was a 93 Accord, so I'm not sure how that compares to you. Uh, yeah, mine was about 16, 17 years old when I was using it primarily. So I've never owned my own car. However, I've used my family's, my parents' car. And so we have a <clears throat> 2003 on an Odyssey and as well as a 2012 Toyota Corolla, but both were bought used. So I, I guess I've been 
driving newer cars than you guys. Yeah. But I don't own it, so I mean, when I when I buy a car eventually, it probably won't be that new, but maybe, who knows. So yeah, it was just last month that I finally paid off the car loan. So I now fully own my 2005 Impala. <laughs> <laughs> just in time, right? Yes, awesome. just just in time to be exactly average. <laughs> Alright, next article. Uh, this one deals with commuting as it compared as it affects health. So having a long commute by car is associated with poor health, but interestingly enough, it's not usually a direct cause. So the causes are actually because people who have long commutes are less likely to exercise, they are less likely to make food at home, and they are more, more likely to purchase non-grocery store food like fast food. They also sleep less. So the reasoning behind this is twofold. One, you don't have as much time to do those things. And also, like, being on a really long commute in a car is honestly draining. Mm -hmm. And when you get home, you, yeah. don't, you don't have, like, the, the mental stamina to do anything that, you know, that might be good for you, but is going to take a little bit of effort. Shifting from a six-minute walk to work to a 40 plus minute drive especially through morning rush hour i can yeah all, all of these are very much so i do not envy you <laughs> so even if you do exercise after your long commute it's still associated with higher blood pressure and chronic neck or back pain as compared to people with shorter commutes people with long commutes are also generally more stressed and less satisfied with life wow this is uh this is really getting cheerful here oh. yeah. yeah right most people with long commutes choose them because they want a larger house or a better neighborhood, but that, that's almost never enough to offset the drawbacks of the commute. And carpooling is a great way to prevent the stress of a, a long commute because you're socializing with other people instead of just losing a couple of hours. My, my question for this is, well, what if my car mates don't want to listen to the podcasts that I like to listen to? <laughs> Wait, you like podcasts? No way. Ian, you might have yeah. to talk to people. <laughs> well, then, but then Ian Deck would actually get to listen to some. Oh, that's a good point. I think you should start with some 8-bit. Decker, let me, let me come to, to work with you. Actually, we are looking for people. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm spoken for. Oh. oh. But it, what, it, for the carpool or the 8-bit? Uh, for the work. It, it pays $14 an hour. Uh, actually, I don't know how many hours I work, so I don't know how much I get paid. <laughs> so I last well, summer 2015, I drove from St. Paul to Eden Prairie every day. That was about 25 miles through that horrible stretch of 494 by the airport and beyond. Mm. I would leave at like 6.50 in the morning, so sleep was a thing that was suffering, to get there by 7.30 just so I could beat traffic. If I was a lot closer, I probably would have gotten to work closer to you know 8.30 or 9 rather than 7.30. So, yeah, I think I slept less. Getting home was even longer. It was probably 45 minutes at the fastest, unless I stayed till 6.30 or something. Then it was maybe 8.30. But yeah, I, the, I remember the first week, it took me an hour and a half to get home each day because I left at like 4.30 and went the, the main route and it just took forever. And then, yeah, I, I was drained. I didn't get very many projects or anything worked on that summer because I was driving. I was tired because I wasn't sleeping enough and I was working all day. So I was just kind of drained. And I think that's my only real commuting job I've had. Otherwise, I've had stuff on campus or whatnot at school. So I think I'm really interested in doing something that's a lot, lot, lot closer to where I live. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can definitely echo that. Um, I actually commuted to a school at the University of Minnesota for the first three years. That's how math works. Three years that I uh, that I went there. For this last semester, I am not, well, I mean, depending on whose definition you use, I'm commuting, but my commute is a 20-minute walk or a six-minute bike ride or, or a six-ish minute bus ride. So I, I definitely echo that, even though I've only got the flip side of that for the past, like, two days. It's definitely a, a lot of what I see as, as coming kind of, like, uh, back from, from that is I get a lot more time, right? Like, I've been able to, like, make myself breakfast at a much more leisurely pace and not have to worry so much about, like, preparing food or the stuff I need to bring for transport, really, because I can essentially carry it all the way to where I need to go whether that is my uh, employ uh, my place of employment or school. So all that is to say, 
uh, essentially what Brian said, but in, in kind of inverse, no, no, the, the inverse positive, I guess, of that. <laughs> wow, that's too much math for me. Hmm. So after last summer, I basically decided I don't want to have to drive more than 15 minutes either direction. Or if, That's a bold statement. Or yeah. I carpool or I take public transportation, and I'd be willing to do a lot longer commute for something like that because it's mm. more – it's it's because then I can kind of bleed into exercise if I have to walk like a mile or something to get to a bus stop or to switch between a bus and another or something. It's just more active. So then it's better use of my time rather than sitting in a car for 45 minutes each way. Mm -hmm. But I so know. I don't have a job so I, yet. So we'll see what happens. I, I, I must be living your dream. A year ago uh, when I lived like way out in the middle of nowhere, my commute was maybe about 20 to 30 minutes or so uh, one way. Yeah. Yeah. When I moved, I moved within like 10 or 15 minutes of where I worked. And like the only main obstacle was dr is driving past a high school. Mm. So so like I do have like a little shortcut through the neighborhood sort of behind. So <laughs> I don't have to, you know, like, you know, wade through teenagers crossing streets <laughs> and uh, soccer moms drop dropping off their kids. That's if I choose to drive to work. Alternately, I can walk for like 15 minutes to the light rail, take that in and walk another like 10 or 15 minutes. That's awesome. That's a good, yeah. good options. Yeah. So it, it takes longer, but I'm getting exercise and getting fresh air and everything. I would ride my bike, but apparently Pittsburgh has a lot of hills. Uh. So <laughs> unless you want to do the tour to France, don't. What I also like about like slightly longer but more active commutes is more time for podcasts to listen to, yeah, or music or whatever you know you, or more time to appreciate nature because like there's a whole patch of woods like right in the yeah. middle of the neighborhood, totally. Mm -hmm. For walks, yes. For bikes, I I know and actually I just thought of this as something else that is a bit of a con for having to do the public transportation. Um, so the job that I'm working right now is a warehouse job for actually the Boy Scouts of America. They do a big popcorn fundraiser right about this time of year. And so now's the time when they come and pick up the popcorn and then all the different individual units distribute that. And that requires a lot of physical labor. Pulling things off pallets, moving pallets, picking up pallets as best I can. Um, and I tend to sweat a bit. And I really don't want to subject the other people on public transit to sweaty, stinky me after a hard day work. And I don't want to sit there and feel the anxiety of crap, 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 crap. You know what Everybody anxiety is, is going me. to cause? More smelly. Yeah. No. So it's, it's, it's not a fun... You just have to subject your housemates to it. I see. So I'm really liking the timing of when we're recording this podcast and when I'm doing all this research because Savannah and I are actually looking at houses right now. I'm in an ideal situation for commuting to my work as it is right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so moving is making me like hyper, hyper aware of all the things that I need to keep in mind to make sure that I don't get trapped in, well, I'm moving to a nicer house, but I, my commute's a lot longer. So the kind of middle ground that I have found, as it were, is midway, uh, because we like it'll be a little bit longer to my work, but it'll be a much shorter bike ride to Ryan's house to come here and rep uh, record podcasts, which is, you know, as we all know, my real job. And it's also like a little bit closer to some of the district level places that I need to go for the for the school district. So overall, I think it will be uh, a good change if you get that house. Right. Well, I, but we're looking in this area. In and then that area, so. you know, since it's a little farther and if you're going to be biking every day, you said half hour bike ride. That's like that. Oh, that's perfectly reasonable. As a and bike that's ride, yeah. and that's more exercise than the 10 minute walk you're doing mm -hmm. now. So that, you know, yes, it's farther, but it's quote, better for you. There is the danger, of course, of not being able to bike when the weather is bad in the winter. And so then mm -hmm. I'll be stuck with, you know, a possibly much longer trans like public transit commute <laughs> because, you know, the buses might be delayed because of the weather as well, et cetera, et cetera, compounds into me being late for school. All right, let's talk about some of those dang millennials. So 
there has been a trend being noticed uh, that young people drive way less today than young people did in the past. So the dip in driving came at the beginning of the rece recession when jobs were scarce and gas was expensive. So at the time it was thought that this might just be a temporary change and then once the economy bounced back then we'd see young people driving more just like everybody else does. But as we've gotten farther away from the reception, reception, recession, it seems like it is a permanent trend. Generation Y prefers to do less driving than Generation X. Likely contributing factors as, to this. Yes. As, as a proud member of Generation Y, I can affirm that. <laughs> and yeah, I, I really started thinking about this when I was taking a look at who we had here on this episode. And I was like, wow, virtually all of us here have like put in the effort in recent months to drive less. Like, every, pretty much all of us uh, either moved closer to work or, um, you know, did something else to, to drive less. I definitely did not do that. That's true. Yeah, you two are the exception, yeah. Ryan, and, Ryan and Decker. Because I have a job. All right, so likely contributing factors to these millennials driving less. Americans reaching driving age today have no living memory of consistently cheap gasoline. Uh, that's a direct quote from one of the articles uh, that really, really kind of resonated with me. In addition to gas prices, auto insurance costs have also risen as the cost of repairs has gone up. It's more difficult to get a permit or license when you're very young these days. They have those provisional licenses and stuff for 15 and 16 year olds. And those are they've kind of come with a lot of restrictions as student debt has gotten bigger, hey, raise your hand if you uh, are mired in student debt right now. Uh, so roughly, I mean, roughly, roughly half of us. I'm I'm better off than most people. I'm only at like 24k right now. <laughs> he says to the one who doesn't have any any student debt. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hate you. I know I'm terrible. There's also a greater preference along, among young people to live near city centers. In some cities, the higher cost of living is offset by easy access to public transportation and more walkable neighborhoods. Um, I have definitely noticed this, especially with like Lower Town and St. Paul is, has been going through kind of a, a resurgence, shall we say. A lot of those artist lofts and, and whatnot are being filled up. Mm -hmm. And especially since CHS Field is there now. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm really happy that those artist lofts are being filled up because there's, well... I like artists. Ooh. Weird how that works. <clears throat> Information technology has also made it way easier to live without owning a car. So, for example, it's easier to find other forms of public transportation. I'm sorry, other forms of transportation like public transportation or car sharing. Um, so, for example, I got by not owning a car this last year by using car to go whenever I needed to go and grab some groceries and, and there was nobody's cars available for me to borrow. Yeah. So also if you're in the habit of being productive on your phone while in transit, which is definitely a habit that you can get in when you're used to being driven around or used to taking public transit already. That's me. Yeah. Um, driving seems much, much less appealing when you just can't get stuff done uh, while doing it. But even so, the car's dominant position isn't going to be going anywhere anytime soon in America. As a driver, I actually sometimes get frustrated when somebody is doing something else on their phone and it's just, I'm really, really, really tired. Or like if it's like either really early morning or really late at night. Because like you mean one of your passengers is doing something on their phone? Yeah. Not, not because I don't like the fact that they're doing something, but one of the reasons why it's really nice to have another person there in the car is to have someone to interact with and to have someone to converse with and keep me awake when I'm driving. Yeah, and keep I'll, all, all I'll of say when I'm, when I'm driving someone, generally when it's not family, I will try to not be on my phone because I would just, yeah, I'd feel guilty, especially if it's a longer trip or something. Or if it's a longer trip, you know, if, you, if we've been talking for an hour and we have three hours to go, I might pull up my phone a little bit or something if they have music yeah. on. But yeah, I I am pretty conscious of that as a more often a passenger than a driver. Now, on the other hand, uh, when I need to drive Matt to Domino's, um, <laughs> as one does, <laughs> as one does, <laughs> as one does, um, I, uh, I I like when he's distracting and not distracting me, because when he's distracting <laughs> himself, he's not swinging his meat cleaver all over the place, and you see. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess it depends on who your passenger is. Yeah. yeah. So when he's using his Nexus 6 it, on his side of the vehicle, it's great because he's not messing with me. He's not like telling me to swerve off the road, watch out for the ducks or whatever. There's no meat cleavers. It's great. I will also mention that 
up until let's see, let me uh, take a little peek here. Uh, April, I w- was not a driver. I did not get my license until mm, April, and so wow. I I didn't need to go anywhere for twenty five years. Oh wait, no, never mind. Uh, twenty years. Uh, I probably shouldn't be driving when I'm three. Um, but I didn't have to go anywhere and it was great. And so then once I had a job, I suddenly needed to go places and I had to get that. And, you know, I'm okay not driving around. That's great. But now that I do, it's also nice. Mm -hmm. So one, one thing that I do think that is worth pointing out is I think that regardless of how or when any of us got our permits or our licenses, it is still an important thing and a really good thing to get them. Because as you have said, and as we've been saying over and over again, Cars are so prevalent in today's society that knowing how to use one, if for some reason the situation arises that you need to use one, is a really good idea. And knowing how to use one safely in particular. So like if, say, you're you're our age and you go out for some drinks and you are no longer able to drive, but your your friend who doesn't drink but doesn't necessarily own a car is there with you. Hey, Buck. Hi. That me. Them being able to drive you and well, yeah, drive 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 your drunk ass home, is is one nice thing. I don't know. Maybe I'm just one of those people who likes to know how to use tools and how to do things. Well, just how to do things and have the tools available. And also extended upon that point, a driver's license is also like the most ubiquitous government issued photo ID. Mm-hmm. It's it's almost easier to just take your driver's test and get a driver's license than go to some other form of ID. Because you're like, well, if I need to do this paperwork to get an ID, I might as well do my driver's license because it's so common. And I would still say that um, that's the case. I thought it was interesting when I went to college because I met a bunch of people who weren't from, like, the middle of St. Paul. And so a lot of people had cars at a rate that it was higher than I was expecting. And people just had got, like, me getting my license at 18 was like strange to them. I think Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. suburbs especially push Mm -hmm. people to drive Mm -hmm. more and earlier. All right. Next up, let's talk about the history of the highway system, Um, specifically keeping in mind, like if we built the highway system from scratch today, would we have done it the same way that it was done originally? And the answer is probably not. So, first up, local governments were basically offered lots of money if they built highways, uh, but they didn't get a lot of control over they went. The people who did have a lot of influence over it was the car industry, um, because the car industry had been working hard to kind of frame highway building as a public responsibility and so this this was kind of a shift from building privately owned toll highways to publicly owned highways funded by taxes on gasoline the idea was that it was still going to be primarily funded by the people who are going to be using it it was just going to be kind of a, a less visible cost for them the perception has stuck around today that highways are pretty much self-funding even though they're not really they're they're heavily subsidized and it has and it did allow highways to expand much much more quickly so 1939 was kind of when when this idea really got into the public consciousness because uh, at the world's fair gm built a kind of a, a mock-up of a of a future city called futurama Mm. Hmm. And it showed big, wide highways that were only accessible by on- and off-ramps. Sound familiar? Hmm. Yeah. It promised to solve the traffic congestion problems of the day. Fast forward a little bit to 1947. A map and a 1955 document uh, together called the Yellow Book outlined the paths that interstate systems would take, both through the countryside and through city centers. The contributors to that document included members of the auto industry and highway engineers. But... Notably, it lacked urban planners, which is understandable because at the time that profession was not really existent. Yeah. So couple that with the majority of funding came from the federal government for the highway system. Makes a lot of sense because they were trying to build a unified thing that was going to connect like the whole country. Mm -hmm. And because Eisenhower was really enthusiastic about the project, he wanted uh, to use it to facilitate troop movements and mass evacuations in the event of a nuclear attack. States were essentially being given highways for free, 
as long as they agreed to the routes that were already laid out in the yellow book, which means that, you know, like, basically nobody said no to it because, mm-hmm. like, that's a lot of stuff that you get, right? Mm-hmm. But unfortunately for cities, the plans weren't really taking into account the needs of people who were moving within the city. It was mostly accounting for people who were going to be moving into and out of the city. Mm. So suburbs were starting to really get big and they were highways were seen as ways to bring commuters into the city centers uh, so that they could work there. I guess nobody really thought about the fact that that means that the tax base is going away from the city. Uh, which is kind of an unfortunate. Yeah. You'd think, huh. well, it's probably the urban planners being sure. missing. Yeah, yeah. Which didn't really exist, as you were saying, but yeah. it's, it's related. Serves them uh, right. <laughs> now, <laughs> the one the one thing that they did kind of plan out in this, in, in this uh, yellow book was that they were going to be using highways as a way to get rid of urban blight. Which, Quotation marks. Yeah, exactly. Which is uh, basically a way of saying, hey, all you poor people who live there who aren't white, we're just going to get rid of your houses. Suck it. Not in A great example is the, the old Rondo neighborhood mm-hmm. in St. Paul. Yep. Now, notice that there are some neighborhoods who were able to prevent highways from coming through, but most of them were higher income and had more political capital mm. to begin with. So they were kind of able to mobilize and rally their local government officials to, to stop it. Now, what happens when you get rid of, like, a bunch of homes that people are living in? Uh, Where are those people going to go? Well, they moved into other houses that are fairly close by, but... Lockdown. Yeah, but that just creates more overcrowding, right? Because now Mm -hmm. there are less houses for the same number of people. So, yeah, the plan was kind of crap. And then the the more wealthy people move to the suburbs, and so Mm -hmm. even more um, loss of money in the urban areas. White flight. Yes. Um, So we've established that... The original highway plan was probably not the best. Can we come up with anything better, the six of us sitting here together? Trains. Whoa. Europe. Yes. Just, just straight up Europe. <laughs> so I think, I think that having highways that connect the city to other things is not a negative. Because, you know, when you're trying to get out of the city to other places, you know, that's a very useful thing. But I don't think that it needs to go, like right through the middle of everything necessarily. And then you, you get things like, you know, inner people just driving across the country. So for example, if you want to go uh, from one city to another, I guess, let's say you're going from Twin Cities to Chicago, you're going to drive through Madison, right? But mm-hmm. well, if even you're going, more, even more importantly, if you're going from the Twin Cities to anywhere east of Chicago, you have to go through Chicago. There's yeah, no true. way around it. So you have these these cities as kind of points for where the highways are because they're obviously where people live. And so you want to go to and from the places. But if you want to go to somewhere even further, you have to go through the cities, thus hitting lots of traffic, especially if you just line it up with rush hour where everyone's driving. So there are, I think, I don't know if with highways what a better solution would be. Just, all right, interstate stops. You now have to go smaller roads, but... Do do other big cities not have bypasses or specific bypass routes? Because I know that for the Twin Cities area, um, 694 actually is listed as a bypass route. So to bypass the Twin Cities. But is there really that much less traffic? on? I've never, I hardly ever take 694, so I don't really know. But I would imagine it's a little less than 94. Yeah, it's not 494. 694 can truly be a trash fire with the best of them, let me tell you. <laughs> so, with, okay, so you saying that makes me think that it's really just all lying. And the bypass might just be that's the shortest route to get from one end of the metro area to the other. Slash, right. you're, 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 moving at, you're moving at 20 miles an hour as opposed to at a standstill. Sure. Yeah. Which is still moving. So I think the solution to all of this really, really is living closer to where you have to go. So you don't have to go as far. So there are a few you're on the road or wherever you are you're commuting for less time taking up less space for that time so there's more space for others that also begs the question of how often are you planning on moving slash how often do you plan on changing jobs yeah because i know that the whole uh, the idea of like a long career at one place is not really it's not so much of a reality anymore well Well, it could be it 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 depends on it depends on the person and the job and i I think i think statistically it's Going down a lot. Holding multiple jobs is a lot more common these days, and that That's makes it hella difficult yeah. to like live close to all of your jobs. Yeah, and I mean, 
Also, just like from my standpoint, I haven't held the same job for the past. Well, okay. In the past year, I have had three, four, five different jobs that I've been running around and working. Sometimes at the same time, a lot of them not necessarily. Like it, it's not really reasonable for me to try and move every single time I get a new job. <laughs> yeah. Too. And also, like even if you have one job and have had it consistently for a while, I think companies are are doing more these days to try and squeeze as much as they can out of out of each uh, employee that they have. Um, for example, my mom has been a nurse at St. Paul Public Schools for quite a while, and um, she she well up until this year uh, was like the head of the daycare at Harding for most of her time, and then like. A couple of days a week, she had to go in the afternoons to other sites that had uh, nurseries to help them out. This year, she's like 0.2 time at Harding, but she's still like the daycare head, and she and then and she's got like multiple other sites that she goes to 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 work. And so like she's driving all over the place to do work at different sites and stuff. How can they justify that? So the w- the way they justify that is because somebody wants to work, and here's the work that they can do, and that way they don't have to pay. A real full time employee at any individual place. Well, but I mean, since it's all still uh, under St. Paul Public Schools for like the whole time, she is a full time employee, yeah. right? It's just that it's like it's point two at Harding, buckets. it's point four at somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. But then each school has yeah, yeah. less of their budget going towards exactly. that job, mm-hmm. right? But SPBS. that's quite unfortunate. They, they tried to do that with me because I'm point eight at Harding teaching computer tech, and then one of the career and tech ed people emailed me over the summer saying like, "Hey." Do you want to like add one class over at Humboldt and and that's a point too? And I'm like, that's a forty minute bike ride. I'm not gonna do that for one class. No way. Let's move on to seniors, uh, specifically talking about how driving, the, the fact that driving is the assumed norm uh, and how it affects you once you, you can't do that anymore. So first off, about 80% of American seniors live outside of urban areas where driving is really the only viable form of transportation. When I read that, I, I went and searched for like transit lines near my Nana's house, and there is one that's at the end of her cul-de-sac. So it's not too far, but, like, yeah. I don't think my grandma up in Lindstrom would necessarily have that. Well, no, she's not exactly in the metro area either. No, she's not. <laughs> Lindstrom might have a route between there and Stillwater. Or, like, maybe. Taylor's Falls. Yeah, maybe. but that's it. Yeah. So, yeah, once you aren't able to drive and you live in, like, for example, a suburban area where you have to drive to get places, it's much harder to get foods and services, good goods and services, including food, you become much more isolated from friends and family, and this can affect your health in a number of ways. So, for example, you don't have anybody to monitor your health and give you health advice. And there's also the psychological effects of isolation. So, uh, society as a whole also misses out on seniors who would volunteer their time if they could get to places. So, yeah, that's the, we're not using our resources fully. Hmm. So our population is getting older. So this problem isn't going away, you guys. It's, it's just going to get worse as time goes on. Drivers past the age of 75 are actually much more likely to be vol- involved in a fatal crash, partly because they're my- more likely to die as a result of being in a crash, um, but also because of slower reaction times and poorer eyesight, as, as, you know, in general. We need a better solution than public paratransit shuttles, because those... You usually have to schedule them long ahead of time, and they typically arrive, like, in a wide window of time. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen this a lot with people who are getting picked up from my church, because they're always like, well, I don't know when it's going to get here, so I'm just going to stay downstairs until it does. Yep. Um, Another thing, too, there there was an article a while ago about particularly the the paratransit system in, in Minnesota, which is coordinated by the Met Council, the same folks who put on Metro Transit and a bunch of other genuinely awesome things for the the metro area the twin cities metro area here like it's it's really that um i'll put a link in the show notes so that way uh you guys can uh, check it out at your leisure but it's a really interesting case study of an implementation that really like they've, they've built a really flexible way for that to work but it's not really sustainable because it's 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 really costly and it still suffers from all all of the kind of systematic issues that you just mentioned yeah 
And most most public transit authorities that have paratransit uh, systems only have them because they are legally obligated to do so by some bill that was enacted in the 90s, I think. Thanks, Clinton. Was it the ADA, maybe? Uh, maybe. Yeah, probably. Probably, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so they, they don't really put a lot of effort into it. They just do the minimum possible to, to get away with it. So there's no law saying they have to be within 20 minutes of being on time. So. Right, yeah. And, you know, as budgets get constrained, those kinds of programs are the first ones to really feel it. Because they don't really make the money. No, they don't. Yeah, no. Not at all. So possible solutions to this problem is that uh, we can increase multi-use neighborhoods that are accessible by wheelchair. So multi-use refers to more walkable neighborhoods where there are amenities close by. You know, think not just residential or not just industrial or not just downtown. You have a lot of different stuff kind of mixed in amongst each other. But how are how would we actually put that into use? Because there's not a lot of neighborhoods that we can necessarily just change like that. Right, yeah. That's why the, the ones that exist are few and far between and were like deliberately planned out and had a lot of publicity behind them right Mm. because they were like look at this cool thing that we're doing and then you realize that it's like okay so this is a three mile stretch that's like two blocks wide and that's it okay yeah yeah the elder village model this one actually i really really liked um so it's an organization that provides services to the elderly so that they can stay in their homes for longer um so they have kind of a mix of paid staff and volunteers and they do all kinds of things from like grocery shopping to simple home repair kinds of things to just like organizing social events and transporting them from you know one thing to another and i was i was so Uh, inspired by the wikipedia article about this that i sent it to my dad and was like hey is this something that we could set up at our church Hmm. and and get that started we can also use things uh like a like a subsidized uber kind of program so Mm. instead of instead of transit systems having to have this fleet of like awkward little buses that go around and pick up a few people just like crowdsource that i guess yeah it doesn't metro transit has a uh, senior discount, I believe. So that's kind of there, yeah. but that's for the, you know, all the normal bus routes. But right. that can be fast too. It, so I will um, also mention. So my grandmother, she can drive. She's seventy three, seventy four this year, and she can drive just fine. But she, you know, has depression sometimes, so she can't go places all the times. So we have to get her groceries. We have to get her stuff. She would never take a bus because there's strangers on the bus. She yeah. Oh, anxiety. it's totally not for everyone. Yeah. Uh, she would almost certainly not even take the little uh, private buses. What do you call those? The shuttle? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that service is called, but she wouldn't even take that because there's also strangers on that. She almost certainly would not take an Uber because, because there's, there's a, a stranger, stranger driving, driving <laughs> in the Uber. Uh, also quite possibly a foreigner, which would also very much scare her to death. Um, <laughs> so no, no matter what you do, you just can't win in some situations. I'm imagining my grandma on the flip side of that just absolutely loving it. Um, because she loves to talk with people, but my thought is, is then, how are we going to make that handicap accept or handicapped accessible for like people who need wheelchairs or people right. who are on maybe even just crutches or walkers? That's not really viable to get into, like maybe say my little station wagon, which is really mm-hmm. pretty low off the ground. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would have to be like SUV sized or minivan or something like that, kind of thing. And you'd probably have to have at least one or two seats removed right. then to get stuff yep. in. Well, um, and that's that's assuming that you can get them in there. Cause exactly. With, the bigger vehicles is harder to get in. Yeah. Well, I mean, just besides that, wheelchairs often, t- and people who are limited to wheelchairs, not just the elderly, but also if we're thinking with the para, or like the, the, the people with disabilities, is some of them are confined to the wheelchairs because they physically can't move outside right. of them. So like at the pool, we have that big arm to get them into the pool. Mm-hmm. And there's similar things on public transit for that, but not necessarily stuff that we can just easily put into people's individual cars who yeah. are Uber drivers. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not sure about your Ryan, you mentioned your, your yes. grandma a little bit, but mm-hmm. um my grandparents my my mom's at least my grandpa's ninety and my grandma's eighty six. She is legally blind and hasn't been able to drive since I think the late like mid to late nineties. But my grandpa can drive, so he, you know, he takes her and she 
they get everything. But otherwise, there's a Lund's not too far. Not a Byerly's, Brandon. A Lund's. Oh. Not too far from their house. And they, they'll walk there maybe 20 minutes or something. So that's, they get some movement. But, you know, so there's stuff. It's kind of the Elder Village model in the sense that there is a supermarket close enough by to them. But they also do drive to some things as well. So I'm curious to see how it goes in the future. Because he's, he's, getting, he's getting older. And, you know, my family is sometimes a little worried about him driving. So we'll start to pick him up or pick them up in situations. So you mentioned walking. Was that something they did? Yeah. So my grandmother almost certainly would not walk because there are strangers outside, but also because she doesn't want to be seen because she says she looks old. You just cannot win. Kind of kind of limiting limiting your options Self-limiting is how it goes. Yeah, yeah. 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 So let's talk about one of uh, one of local government's favorite forms of trying to solve traffic problems, uh, and that would be expanding road capacity. Yay. Yeah. Yay. So expanding road capacity has been shown to not alleviate traffic. Aww. People just drive more to fill the road that's there, and it remains congested. I think they show that when there's construction, less people drive because it's more inconvenient. So when there's more road space, like, oh, it'll be it'll be better because there's this new lane. So then they'll drive where maybe they wouldn't have before, thus filling the road up again. Yeah. And this is this happens because, like, on the face of it, we're not charged to use roads. Yes, uh, a lot of them are funded through, like, gas taxes and stuff. But that, like, the percentage of the road that is funded by that is becoming less and less. And even as it is, like, that's kind of an invisible cost to people. They don't think about that. So using the roads more when there is more road is just the logical thing to do from an individual standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of that, that uh, what is that, the paradox of the commons or something like that in economics? Even improving public transit systems doesn't solve the problem because the people who go from driving to using public transit, that would take less people on the road. But the people who are still on the road just use the road more to fill it up. So traffic traffic doesn't go down, ever. Ah, but there is a, a possible solution. The only method that has really proven effective is called congestion pricing, where they charge for road use at peak traffic times. So you could imagine this easily in like a downtown area where, you know, when lots and lots of people are trying to get in or get out, they're charged money to do so. But if you want to get in or out of downtown by like walking or biking or taking a bus, then you don't have to pay for using the road. Um, that happens in London right now, yes. I believe, in a, within a certain zone. Yep, I think, what, what was it, uh, London and Japan were the two that the article cited as having that, that mm. kind of system. Yeah, and it's you can imagine that it's, that's going to be a pretty unpopular uh, system uh, because people have gotten used to using roads for free and they don't want to have to pay for them. And, uh, it, and it, it is like one, one of the... One of the most legitimate arguments against it is that it's pretty regressive because, you know, people who are richer can just afford to pay that and then they get to keep using their cars and, and that's more convenient for them. But people who don't have that kind of money are going to be relegated to crappier forms of transportation, right? But, like, we already have very regressive forms of transportation as it is. And, and you know, the, the, funding, the current systems for funding roads... It basically takes from everybody and then just gives to the the people who are driving. So it's not like it's getting any more regressive than it already is, kind of thing. Yeah, let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about charging money for roads. How do you guys feel about it? How much would, would this be like a toll during rush hour? Probably. That... Or is it a subscription? <laughs> Brandon, are you familiar with how it's set up in London? Yeah. So like. In a certain zone, it's kind of, it's the way I understood it to be is kind of like set up almost with like, uh, like the same way you do like a toll or like min pass here, right? Where like carriers in particular, uh, except, except there's like a certain scenario wherein it's just like, like, like there's, there's no, like in Chicago, right? When you drive to Chicago, you have those toll lanes that you go through like actively, right? It didn't seem like that was the case. It seemed like in London it was just like all automatic somehow. I'm not super familiar with it. And I was frantically Googling it right maybe? now. 
Uh, yeah, exactly. It might be done by license plates, but I know, for example, uh, we took like mostly, mostly like taxis and stuff when, when I was in London. And as a result, like most of the times what would happen is I just hear the taxi, the taxi driver would just grumble about the fact that, oh, I'm entering the downtown zone. So I have to, <laughs> I have to pay the fee. You guys don't have that in the U S really, do you? That just happened like clockwork every time. So hmm. After doing the research for this podcast, I I wanted there to be more toll systems to, you know, kind of take more of the percentage of uh, road maintenance and put that on the people who are actually using the roads. And then also, like, kind of double whammy to encourage people to drive less, which is definitely something that I want to happen. Because the, the more we can kind of encourage people to use other forms of transportation, the more easily we will be able to shift infrastructure away from just being like car centric and then and, and making it more viable for other forms of transportation. And eventually maybe we'll be able to have most of our neighborhoods be these like mixed use, walkable, bikeable neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to take a lot to to kind of reduce the the assumption that cars are the the only way to go weird thought what if they had tollways set up along like the city limits so like if you were coming in from a suburb or going out to a suburb during rush hour times you would be charged but not necessarily if you were living in the city that could combat mm. a little some, bit of the regression. Some some cities are pretty huge and can generate their own traffic downtown mm -hmm. just by yeah. people living in the city. I know, but it's 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 not necessarily freeing up congestion then as much. I mean, it would a little bit, but it's also getting rid of some of that, the regressiveness of that tax, which is what we had said was um, the biggest argument against it. And I mean, it's not a, it's obviously not going to be a perfect system, but that way it's a lot more for the people who can more easily afford it as opposed to the people who are living in cities, which are generally lower income. Yeah, unless unless you're able to shift the desire, the de, you know, the desirable area back to the city center, which I, I think is, is a, a trend that we're seeing, not like in overwhelming amounts, but it's definitely there. Right, right. And I, I think I think that's an interesting idea, too, with I'm going to kind of sneak in some real-time follow-up here and mention that London system uses license plate readers to make this happen, uh -huh. to, to make their scheme happen. So you were you were correct, Brian. But like I think I think that you're onto something, Decker. About the I think that would work particularly in Minneapolis and St. Paul because of the way that those cities are structured. But that yeah. might not. But but the the specifics of that clearly might need to be ironed out. So it, uh, it could... and might not apply to other cities in the same way. Yeah. It, it could, going back to London, they have a in their transit system. They have a, like tiers. So how far are you out from the city center? So you you pay more for using transit outside of the city. Hmm. I want to say Amsterdam might be the same. Copenhagen is absolutely like that as well. So you pay more for how far you go. It could be kind of similar like that for driving, where you know if you're in your own little area, you don't pay anything. But if you go a little farther out, you pay just a little bit. Or yeah, it's like fare zones. Yeah. Uh, last article. So this is about parking uh, and and the concepts of free parking and also uh, parking that is kind of municipally mandated. So Donald Shoup of UCLA says that we should charge for parking anywhere where the number of cars is greater than the number of sp spots to park. Hmm. What a revolutionary idea. Weird. But... There are a few reasons why it is currently free. So, for example, parking meters emerged a few decades after the invention of the car. So people had a lot of time to get used to just parking their cars willy-nilly wherever they wanted to without, you know, the man telling them that they couldn't. Uh, so there's, you know, a lot of resistance to that kind of thing. And, yeah, it's, it's hard to start charging people for something that the government owns and that has been free in the past. Space is finite, though, and so parking spots should be considered a limited good. Definitely a true statement there. Yeah. And it costs a lot to maintain shaft? 
I, I'll explain this because I'm the one that wrote these notes. So um, there's a lot of costs to both build and maintain parking spots. So it shafts people who don't use cars. Ah, okay. Yeah. And Got so it. it's the, the numbers that he listed were it's about seven or a little bit shy of two grand to build and then about $400 annually to maintain. And this and is just for one parking spot. For one parking spot. And then you have so many more on top of that. And we, we all pay through that. A lot of it is through gas taxes, but obviously that's definitely not all of it. In fact, it's actually losing money at this point. Mm. This next point really gets me. So building standards in many dense cities require, when you're building a, a new building kind of thing, it requires you to have parking space included. And that usually costs around thirty to $50,000. And so then the price of, of building all of that is passed on to the consumer, to the people who are using that building. But, like, not everybody is going to be using that parking space. So, yeah, the rest of us are, are essentially paying for the parking that other people are using. Mm -hmm. And then, like, just think about, think about, like, how much parking there is out there that doesn't doesn't fill up, doesn't get used. You know, how many times are you downtown St. Paul and you just see a bunch of parking lots that don't have any cars in them, mm -hmm. you know? I'm actually, if, if I might like jump in here for a sec, I'm actually kind of intrigued by this. Like how much would you all say, I, I don't spend a ton of time in downtown St. Paul, but like how much of the paid parking in St. Paul is run by the city versus by, by the buildings themselves? Because I know in, in Minneapolis, it's definitely, definitely, definitely more common have privately owned parking garages in particular i think most of it is privately owned um the spots on the street where you can park you know are the the only like publicly owned ones that i can think of other than yeah. specific places like union depot which is you know like a big bus depot and then they have yeah. a part a yeah, yeah, huge yeah. parking lot uh connected to that and i mean the only ones i've ever really parked in are on the street because i don't really look for the big yeah uh, the event parking the event the, parking yeah. yeah it's simply because those generally cost more to park into yeah. a phone. Right. Especially Absolutely. If especially yeah. if I'm just gonna be there for like a couple of hours or like even sometimes if it's just an hour, hour and a half and I'm grabbing food with people. And actually what you just said speaks to one of the next bullet points, which is that, you know, when people know that there is a parking spot that costs more, but they, they just haven't found it yet. People are going to drive around looking for cheap parking spots for a longer time, which means that we've got more people driving longer right yep which is you know bad for all sorts of reasons from just increased traffic for all the people who are on the road to increased co2 emissions because you know we're driving the cost of gasoline and yeah you know, exactly time is probably the most reliable one yeah so yeah um a suggested solution is switching to charging for parking based on the market price so for example if a spot is occupied greater than 80 percent of the time raise the price of that meter by 25 cents per hour and if it's unoccupied oh, not, for not 80 i think that, that was supposed to be a 60 let 60? me double check okay well yeah certain percentage if it's being used a lot uh, oh, or sorry the 60 is the lower oh than, okay yeah. yeah yeah and then less yeah. than 60 percent okay yeah and then yeah um lower the cost by 25 cents per hour if it's being used less than 60 percent of the time yeah i mean that would that's another way yeah totally i think that that makes perfect sense because mm -hmm. i mean market price is market price and it's it's the worth of things are whatever someone is willing to pay for it as we learned from civilization four I guess, like, one of the things that I kind of wonder with that is, like, um, that that's, like, a really interesting algorithm to, to set that up. What One thing that I'm thinking, and maybe this is because it's late and my brain is skewing towards, like, speculative fiction right now for some reason. <laughs> but, like, if, 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 like, the Uber surge algorithm, for example, were to be applied to something like that, right, the, that, that would be another way to kind of balance that. Um, but so then like, what is yeah. the Uber surge algorithm? I've never heard of that. Oh, so like Uber, like the Uber, the car sharing service, like they also increase, increase the, the uh, price. cost. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Per based on a couple of different parameters and it's not like fully transparent how that happens, but it seems to be doing really well for them. <laughs> okay. Cause uh, they, they, they seem to just 
it's like a balance between keeping the 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 parameters that that kind of alter the price a little bit nebulous in such a way that people still feel even in during certain surge you know one one time or two times or three times surges they still the price still seems desirable despite being inflated over what you might normally expect i know part of that um, is if your phone battery is getting is quite low they'll make they'll charge you more hmm. oh my god seriously what? i did not know yeah that. i think yeah. that sounds awful that's, that's, that's actually part of it, kind because, of super predatory and not cool yeah well it totally fits into what you're saying <laughs> well they should also go a step further then so that if you have a low signal strength it costs even more and then hmm, you know like if it's nighttime it should cost even more uh we can you know if it's raining it should cost more we can think of all these things just tack on more yeah I think that really the only thing that they that they've used to try this out because it actually has been tried out. They didn't necessarily say where, but it was just simply some pressure plates that were put underneath the road to pay attention to. All right, when is the space being occupied and when is it not? I have to say, from my time using Cartago, having the cost of parking taken out of the equation has is, is like a huge encouragement to to using the service. Because, you know, like if I need to drive to downtown Minneapolis to go to like a live show or something like that, like, yeah, it, it costs me like six to ten dollars to get a car to go to go there. But I don't have to worry about like paying for parking. Mm-hmm. So like does car to go pay for. Yeah, they, they yeah, on, they, on they uh, have paid the cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis uh, for the privilege of all of their cars just getting free parking. Wonderful. Yeah. But not in private lots or anything. No, no, no. It's Yeah, it's just the street parking. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's nice. But then you also, yeah, so you don't have to pay for parking. And then that's still cheaper than an Uber. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's about it for individual car ownership, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this exploration. We put a lot of miles on this subject. <laughs> oh. Hey. Oh. Yeah, I was trying a little too hard from that one. That was good, though. That was a good pun. High-quality pun. I think we I railroaded you into that one. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, no. All right, I should not have thrown down the gauntlet sure in front of this Decker. One off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, if you would like to read the show notes once again, you can go to thenexus.tv slash TED15. If you would like to get in touch with us, you know, Tell us what you want to hear us talk about, or um, if you want to be on a future show, let us know. Uh, We've got this lovely contact link underneath all of our lovely faces on uh, on the website. Alternatively, you could hit us up on Twitter. I'm Ian R. Buck. I am underscore B-R-I-A-N-M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L underscore underscore Brian Mitchell. Some people might not know it's with an I or a Y. (laughs) I think I'm just Bigfoot1138. Is there, is there a place where they can get in touch with you that's better than Twitter? It's better than Twitter. Yes, because Twitter is literally the worst way. Um, <laughs> get in touch with Buck. He'll find me. <laughs> well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially at Doherty. That's it. I'm always only at Doherty. <laughs> uh, no, you can actually find me on the Twitter at Ryan Amar and, of course, on my website, which is ryan.rampersad. No, it's not. It's ryanrampersad.com. <laughs> Brandon? Sure. Uh, you can find me on the internet in a lot of places, but mostly on Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, each, or uh, <laughs> that other network that I'm currently forgetting. Uh, it doesn't matter because my name is always Yo, App.net, Google app. Plus. <laughs> app.net, indeed. Google Plus, not even once. Or you can also find me on my website, which is very similar to that, but slightly different. Brandon.mn. I'm holding on to that debate for the rest of my life. You can find me on my podcast, uh, Control Structure, on this very podcast network. Sweet. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a good one. Have a good Watch one. for cars. Oh, hey. Yes! Yes!